Okay, so welcome everybody to this, uh, this seminar, webinar. And today we have with us Alexander Lenz, who is a very serious experienced uh, physicist, uh, and especially his expertise in the V physics, but he has a long experience in uh, many different areas of theoretical physicists. And today he's here with us to speak about Perasper and Astra, the impact of high precision standard model predictions for new physics searches. So please, Alex. So thanks a lot for the invitation. And I'm of course very sorry for myself for not being in person in Madrid. Actually, I would have been last week already in Spain. So everything was planned perfectly. Okay, I hope we can do this on another time. And my idea is to advertise a little bit with multi-loop or non-perturbative calculations, which I don't know, maybe sometimes we don't have the most attractive reputation, but which are really necessary for doing all this program of indirect searches for new physics. So for doing the fun stuff, for doing model building and trying to find um, the model which is really describing natures. Oh no, it's again not working if I sc uh, share my screen. I cannot. So now it's unshared on my screen. Yeah, you, you have unshared it. But the problem is I couldn't change the slides. I had it already last week while it always was working before. Should I try once more full yeah. screen? Okay, let's see what's happening. Okay, so this is also nicely pictured. I'm showing this because I really like the joke done by Thomas Mondel at the conference where he was explaining the progress in flavor physics with a shipping cruise. So we want to go to the island where we learn uh, what nature is really made of. And for that, we have our fun deck on top. And these are the people who are doing model building, who are all doing the fun things, playing with laptop quarks, being, playing with subprime models. But what really keeps the ships going is this hard work, which has to be done in the machine deck. This is calculating the free loop correction to this or that, calculating, doing big lattice calculation, doing summary calculations and stuff like that. Okay, so I think probably not everybody of you is working on flavor physics, so I would like to motivate a little bit what I'm talking about, why we are doing that, when as an example, which is a very valuable, or which contains very valuable observables. It's B mixing, and we had quite some progress where mostly on the non perturbative side, so the experimental precisions already for quite some time, quite high. And now finally, also theory precision cannot completely cope, but at least it, it, it could reduce the uncertainties significantly, which made it possible to gain some very interesting insights. And finally, I'm talking about some other aspects of mixing under the name of decay rate differences, but also very fundamental properties of particles like uh, lifetimes of heavy baryons. Okay, motivation for flavor physics. If you look at the Lagrangian of the standard model, then of course, one thing maybe on the first line is we have to understand QCD because QCD will always give us the background. And whenever we have a nice anomaly, we must make sure that it's not just a missing loop correction, um, underestimated uncertainty or something like that. When another motivation for flavor physics is of course determining the standard model parameters, of course, for flavor, it's first of all the CKM matrix, but also quark masses and like that. A very big motivation is understanding the origin of CP violation. Okay, in the standard model, CP violation is in the third line in this fly, which is the you cover coupling as soon as this is a complex number when we have CP violation in the standard model, which seems to be small compared to what be required from um, cosmological investigation. So hopefully we think if we study the processes where we have already standard model CP violation in more detail, maybe we find some additional parts which could point towards a solution of this meta-antimeter asymmetry. And finally, of course, we would be interested in how to modify this Lagrangian, how to, with what to add it. So doing some search for new physics, or even just understanding the standard model a little bit better. So under the name of the flavor problem, where do the hierarchies come from in the CKM matrix, in the quark masses, and so on. Uh, sorry, but somehow, for some reason, does anybody know what this could be? Why, if I'm going to full screen, why it seems at some point it stops allowing me to change the slide? 
it was working. But it stopped. I, I was pressing and then I cannot do any further. So nobody having any experience with that? Okay, a last try else I don't go to full screen anymore. Okay, so what I'm talking about with flavor physics is in principle a broad name. I mean by flavor physics today, mostly the physics of the bottom quark and the charm quark. So we have a lot of uh, experimental results. We have the CERN experiments are running in Beijing. There's also BES3 doing charm physics soon in Japan, Bell 2. Well, not soon, so we're already running, we are joining in, but soon we will have a precision which is competitive um, to, to the LRCB to the LRC experiments. I will not talk today about the Kion experiments, so where we have NL62 and Koto running with very interesting results. The objects. I'm mostly discussing are B and D mesons. So if you look at the last line, B mesons, roughly a mass of about 5 GeV. The lifetimes of all the B mesons are very, very similar. The only thing which is a little bit dropping off is the BC lifetime. The reason is that now the B quark and the charm quark were both weakly decaying with a similar size of the total decay rate. So therefore you immediately are reducing the lifetime by a factor two. And we have the D mesons, so lighter, roughly mass is around 2 GV. And if you look there at the lifetimes, when there's already quite a big spread, so between 0 0.4 and 1, so something like a factor of 2.5. So we will come back to this why in the B system all the lifetimes are so close together, why we are spreading much more in the charm system. Okay, what I'm talking about is the case of these hadrons. Now, we're now, depending on what kind of final state I have, this defines my difficulty, my, my hadronic difficulty of the decay. The simplest decay of a meson from a hadronic point of view is if the meson is decaying only into leptons. So when I have only QCD in the initial state. The next simple is if I have a semi-leptonic decay. So I have one meson and the W is decaying into leptons. You see, you already can draw more gluons, gluon in the initial, gluon in the final, and the blue gluons are going between initial and final state. And finally, I have non-leptonic decays, where also the W is decaying into quarks, and where you can have many, many possibilities for having gluon exchanges, perturbatively and non-perturbatively. So far, I was showing in the first line only three level decays. You can have the same on loop level. So if the basic standard model process is already loop level, this would be, for example, if a BS meson is decaying into a mu plus, mu minus. And again, from a hadronic point of view, it's as simple as the first diagram as the leptonic tree level decay, but the loop structure, of course, makes it more interesting from BSM search point of view because this is suppressed in the standard model via loop and if there's a new physics contribution you might hope that this could be so large that it's competitive to a loop decay but maybe it's hard to being so large to be competitive to a tree level decay. You also have loop level um, semi-leptonic decays which are the famous B to K, B to <coughs> K star mu mu, so where all the anomalies are arising or also um, decays like K to pi nu nu, but okay, I said I'm not talking about chaos physics. And from the non-leptonic side, of course, we have decays which also can only happen via penguin, but I decided to show you here the mixing uh, diagram, which gives the transition of a B meson into an anti-B meson. So these are roughly the classes of decays we are considering. From left to right, the hadronic things are becoming more complicated. From top um, to, to the lower line, I'm going from tree level decays in the standard model to loop level decays in the standard model. Why is it again? It's tell ah, okay, okay. So again, coming back to my motivation, <clears throat> typically always the strongest argument for flavor is barren asymmetry in the universe. On the other hand, to be honest, there's, I think there's really some research missing how to exactly relate this amount of CP violation we are seeing with the meta antimatter asymmetries. So there are some research is going on that just recently last week at FPCP, we had a very nice talk really relating this asymmetry with CP violation and B mixing. 
Another thing I think which is really working well is indirect searches for BSM physics. So for looking for new physics, you all know you have in principle two methods. Either you build a bigger accelerator, you have more energy, uh, you collide your protons or electron or whatever you like, and you want to have so much energy that you can create the new states on shell. This would be a direct search. We are doing here the, a different method. We measure as precisely as possible. We calculate as precisely as possible. We compare the two. And when the allowed remaining space uh, could be due to new physics, and this gives us some parameter constraints on BSM models. And I have chosen here the picture of the Trojan horse. It's actually a joke by Guy Wilkinson, who was uh, comparing the direct searches with the yeah, somehow unsuccessful effects um, attempts of attack attacking Troy with full power with brute force but when we were using a little bit more brain power when we managed to get into the city and with using more brain power guy was equating with indirect searches I of course absolutely agree with him um, when the big problem for this but this program is of course making sure that in my function of the standard model I have the uncertainties under control and uncertainties are given by QCD. So therefore we really were building up a big toolkit. So we have the starting point is always the effective Hamiltonian, but this is already known to next to next to leading order now. And when we have different applications, expansions, going under the name of heavy quark expansion, heavy quark effective theory, we have SCAT and so on. And interestingly, also with some of these tools which were originally used in flavor physics now have more applications in collider physics in Higgs physics and so on. So people are really liking to use this idea of, I don't know, standard model effective theory or so on. And finally, there's a kind of bread and butter physics. We have the CKM matrix containing quite some parameter. These parameters are also necessary for making predictions in different fields and flavor physics is providing a possibility of measuring them precisely and really getting the values known very well. Okay, so coming back to the original classification and showing you a little bit how all these decays actually fulfill my motivation. So the first decay, again, the semi-leptonic leptonic decay, no, the, sorry, the leptonic decay on tree level. So if you look a little bit closer, then first of all, we have QCD. So we have, from a QCD point of view, a meson is decaying into nothing because leptons are nothing for QCD. So we don't interact. So I have a matrix element of a meson decaying into vacuum. And this is parametrized by decay constant. So for, for describing the hadronic input of this decay, you need a method which can uh, determine the decay constant, which is nowadays mostly lattice. And if you look at the coupling, at the coupling of a B and U, the CKM element VUB is arising. So first of all, this would be a possibility of measuring VUB. <clears throat> okay, in this decay, if we just have this one diagram, and of course, no ZP violation is arising, but in principle, VUB has an imaginary part, which also would give some insight to uh, ZP violation. And if you're looking for new physics, well, the first thing that you could think about when looking at this diagram is replacing the W minus by H minus, if you have a two Higgs doublet model or SUSE or something like that, when this would give you a contribution you have to take into account when you compare the standard model prediction with experiment. <coughs> For the semi-leptonic decay, now the hadronic part is becoming a little bit more complicated. It's now matrix element of, in this case, of a B meson decaying into a D meson, which is parametrized as a, decay, uh, sorry, as a form factor. So it's not only a number, it's now a function depending on Q squared on the momentum transfer, which is going through the W Again, if you look at the coupling, you would now have the CKM element VCP. So it's a motivation of determining standard model parameter. If you're thinking about um, indirect new physics searches, you also could, uh, you could replace the W minus by the H minus. Okay, and finally going to the non-leptonic decay here, things are becoming, of course, very tricky. And currently, you cannot really calculate this from first principles, so you have to make some additional assumptions, okay, which are well tested and which are really 
well justified, but you have to do some additional input. And here, as an example, I have give you a simplified form of assuming factorization. So that this matrix element of B going into a D and the pi is factorizing in a form factor. So B going to D and factorizing in the pi on decay constant. Okay, another motivation for flavor physics is, of course, that we are now in the lucky uh, position of having huge amount of data. So we had the old B factories, we had Tevatron, we had the old B factories. Now um, we have the LHC experiments, dominantly LHCB, but also Atlas and CMS are joining into the game and we're one hand by trying to cross-check with anomalies which were seen at LHCB, but they also have a very rich physics program. And Bell 2 just started, we're already producing results. Many of the results still have some large uncertainties, but this will of course be extremely interesting. So that's a picture of LHCB, just to see that, okay, there's quite some manpower. Um, involved and there's quite some output, many papers, many citations, many interesting results. Okay, what is of course <clears throat> probably most people are discussing are the anomalies. I have written down here a list of anomalies, it's not an exhaustive list. So one class of anomalies is arising in semi-leptonic loop level decays. So if you remember, it was my second row, the second line. So this is decays like B to K pi. Unfortunately, the individual anomalies, so if you look just at one observable, they are still not too pronounced. By something like two to three sigma, that uh, experiment is deviating from standard model. But if you do combine fits, so when currently these deviations are going up to something like almost seven sigma, so it seems to be very interesting for that people are I don't know what's the latest number, but I think it's something like 175 observables. So it, it's a real big fit. Then it seems also that we see some deviation in semi-leptonic tree level decays. So decays which have, from the standard model point of view, a very simple structure. It's mostly B to D. So B meson to D meson, and when a tau in the neutrino and you compare this to B to D meson, so the same hadronic input, but not the tau lepton, but instead a muon or an electron. And just the most recent analysis just gave values which are slightly above uh, four sigma. When just very recently an interesting experimental anomaly was showing up, so I think there's no uh, new physics explanation possible for that. Um, if you look at the decay of a beam meson decaying into a shape psi and a phi, then you can extract many interesting parameters. You can extract the lifetime of the BS meson with a very high precision. You can extract uh, the decay rate difference between the neutral mesons. Neutral mesons are mixing, so we have a heavy and a light eigenstates, and we have a decay rate difference. And you can extract a weak mixing phase, so a mixing phase which is stemming from, from BS mixing, which in the standard model should be very close to zero, so this offers the possibility of doing a nice null test. And just really very recently, we had last week quite some extensive discussions. It turns out that ATLAS is deviating by something like four sigma from LHCB, CMS is also deviating by something like four sigma from LHCB, and also uh, CMS and LRCB are deviating by each other, but only by two sigma. We'll come back to that. Okay, so muon G minus two, just last week we had the theory update. I think it's now 3.7 sigma. We are of course eagerly waiting for new experimental numbers. When there's an elder asymmetry, the muon asymmetry is still unsolved. Um, at some point there were rumors that CMS might be able to cross-check that. So there's now a big B physics program at CMS. We have 10 to the 10 B decays on tape. Um, but I didn't hear back whether this really turns out <coughs> that we can measure with a pre precision which is comparable to the zero. Epsilon K, that's the place where in 1964 the p-violation was found in the k-mixing, where it depends what you take as standard model input. If you take the inclusive value for VCB, when uh, you sit spot on and there's no discrepancy, if you take the exclusive value for VCB, I will come back to that, when you differ by 4.2 sigma. 
Okay, there are some elder things like set to BB coupling at lab. And okay, the rest maybe we don't have to discuss in detail, but just to show there are some interesting deviations. And that's, of course, always a nice playing ground for theorists to check what's going on. How could we, so do we have, at one point, do we have hadronic physics under control? And on the other hand, just assuming that we have it under control, what consequences would this have for model building? Okay, so now let's, so this was in principle the big motivation plot and just giving a brief overview of what people are discussing in flavor physics. Now I would like to go a little bit more in detail into mixing because mixing can really cover many of these different aspects. So mixing, you have a B-meson and within the standard model, you can write diagrams, which is transforming actually here on the left side, the B-quark that's part of the anti-B-meson. So the anti-B-meson can transform into a B-meson via this one loop diagram, via this box diagrams. And you can write down for the same transition, a different topology. And now you call the part where the diagram, if you cut it through, if it's if it can be on gel, this part you call gamma one two. So the first part could of course not be on gel because if you calculate, uh, if you cut down the two Ws, you cannot have a B meson decaying into two Ws. That's uh, not possible. But if you're on the right hand side, if you cut through the quark lines when the up quark or jump quark is running, then you could have a on gel contribution. So this will be called gamma one two and the off shell part where both diagrams and all quarks can contribute uh, will be called M12. The relative phase between M12 and gamma12 for convention an additional minus is included is denoted by phi. Okay now we can look at what are the physical observables. So in principle this B meson is created as a quark eigenstate but it's actually propagating as either heavy eigenstate or final eigenstate so like neutrinos only with the additional thing that here the B mesons are also decaying and you can measure the oscillation frequency which is given mostly by the mass difference. So the mass difference delta m is the mass of the heavy eigenstate minus the mass of the light and if you do your algebra when you see to a very very good approximation this is two times m12 and m12 was the off shell part. m12 is due to heavy internal particles, therefore this is considered to be very sensitive to new physics effects. So if you're a fan of the Higgs doublet model, then you immediately would draw the diagram where the W minus is replaced by a H minus. <clears throat> when you have also decay rate difference, this is given by two times gamma one two times cosine phi. In the standard model, phi is more or less zero, so cosine phi is one. So for good approximation, you can forget about it. Okay, but whenever I do numerics, I of course include it and sometimes uh, also include the corrections. Dominantly, this is due to light internal particles up and charm. So you would, at first sight, you would say no new physics. And there were actually bounds around in the literature that uh, this cannot be affected by new physics except phi. But of course, this is not correct. But if you look, for example, at the upper right diagram, and if you only consider charm anti charm, well, you just have to replace the W minus by H minus, you integrate the H minus out, and when you have a new physics contribution to gamma one two. And finally, we have some certain CP asymmetries, which are called flavor specific or semi leptonic CP asymmetries. Flavor specific decay is a decay where the B meson can decay into a final state F, but the anti B meson cannot. Now, if you look at my de definition, I exactly have written what cannot happen. So the B bar cannot decay into F, but I have not written B bar, I have written B bar of T. So this is if the meson is created as a B bar, it cannot decay, but it will oscillate. This is meant by B bar of T. So it will oscillate into a B meson and the B meson can decay. Now it's minus B decaying to F bar. Again, B cannot decay into F bar, but since I have the time dependent meson, so this B can mix in a B bar, which can then decay into F bar. And so in the end, you're measuring the difference between the probability of a B bar mixing into a B minus a B mixing into a B bar. So just turning them around. So therefore it's called CP violation in mixing. And here, when you do the algebra, the time evolutions of the mesons, you get gamma one two over M one two, which is a small number in the standard model, something like five times 10 to the minus three 
times sine phi. If you remember, I said uh, phi is close to zero. So actually for BS mesons, it's something like one over 250. So you have a very small number. And we saw also quite some nice null tests of the order of 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five in the standard model. And currently there's a big experimental effort going on in bringing the bounds down uh, on this quantity. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing, the mass difference. That was the first observable. They are measured extremely precisely. If you look at the central values, 17.757 and uncertainty of 0 0.021. So really amazingly precisely known. Now you can look at the corresponding theory expression. You can already guess when you look at the box diagram, you have the CKM elements. So you have VTP, VTS appearing twice. This is encoded in my vector lambda T squared. When you're doing the box diagram, if you calculate it, uh, you will get the Iname limb function. This is giving you the loop. If you are strong and if you can do QCD corrections to that, when you get this factor eta, which is giving you the relative size of next leading order QCD correction plus leading order compared to the leading order one. And you have something like B times FPS squared. So if you do the calculation, you will be left Okay, you have four quark spinners. You will see in the standard model that mostly one Dirac structure is surviving a V minus A, V minus A structure, which is given in the lower left corner. And if you take the matrix element of this operator between a B meson and the anti B meson, then you can parametrize it in terms of the decay constant, which was appearing in the leptonic decays, times a back parameter. There's an approximation which is called a vacuum insertion approximation and this assumes that the back parameter is equal to one. And nowadays there's quite some industry going on. So there are many lattice groups working on calculating this matrix element. There's also some recent, very recent improvement in some rules, in HQT some rules. So these back parameters for mixing are already quite well known. So we still would have some further confirmation and it also turns out that B is very close to one. Okay, so this is now a state of the art plot. What are the theory predictions for delta ms, that's on my x axis, and delta md on my y axis? The experimental number are given by the black cross. Experiment is so precise that we had to multiply the uncertainties by a factor 10 in order to see them. So this is not, the uncertainties are not the real scale. You have to shrink them down um, to a factor of 10. And there was, I think, some really interesting and important development going on. In 2016, the most recent state of the art calculation was the red blob, which was Fermilab milk, which also dominated absolutely the flag. Okay, now let's go back in history. So let's first do the flag 2013. So the big gray area was flag 2013. Flag is a flavor lattice averaging group. So it's a combination of more or less all lattice groups and they combine their different determinations. And then they give a common parameter set, which uh, can be used from people working in phenomenology. So if you look at 2013, we had a huge uncertainty in this gray blob. When Fermilab was improving everything and they made the red blob with an amazing increase in precision, but they are a little bit of uh, the experimental value. And I will show you later what this actually, so naively you think, okay, maybe it's a two sigma effect, you shouldn't worry about two sigma effect, but for model building, this would have a huge effect. Um, when we could join in the game with some rules, and so it started in 2017, the problem was that some rules took such a long time for doing that you have to do the sum rule perturbatively at free loop. And okay, this wasn't, actually it would have been possible from 2008 on, but anyway, nobody uh, saw that it could be done. And finally, 2017, we could do it. The Siegen group was doing it before for BT mesons, we could redo it for BT mesons and also for lifetimes. And in 2019, we also could include MS corrections and we received the dark blue plot. So a considerable shift downwards closer to experiment. And very recently HPQCD was updating lattice and where um, maybe somebody of you have heard uh, Christine Davis talks about really claiming that this is now the way to go, what we are doing and 
this is from the lattice side, the results you should take into account. Fermilab is working on an update. It, of course, would be extremely interesting to see what's happening with the red blob and also to see the reason why the red blob is so far away. And we were creating averages of all the lattice and some rule results giving us the black area. Okay, this is just to compare what's happening over the years. <clears throat> the central values for mixing were staying relatively constant, so there were not huge shifts, but the uncertainties due to the non-perturbative parameters of the red mark line was really improving amazingly. Okay, so what consequences does this have? Um, I don't have a time, so how I'm, how I'm with time, Luca? Uh, it's uh, still in our, another 50 minutes, 35 minutes. Okay, so okay. So in, in principle, for, for calculating this matrix elements in the standard model for the mass difference, only the V minus A color singlet operator is arising. But already, if you look at delta, <coughs> gamma S, the decay rate difference, different Dirac structures and different color structures would arise. So you have a bunch of operators, you have five operators. Uh, these five operators would also arise if you do some general new physics models in, for B mixing. Again, you parametrize them in terms of a decay constant and a back parameter. Sometimes the parametrization is a little bit more complicated, but this is always made in such a way that for vacuum insertion approximation, the back parameters B1 to B5 are equal to 1. Okay, so this is a comparison of results for the back parameter of the BD meson. So these are the lattice groups. So that's the uh, European Twisted Mass Collaboration, Fermilab Milk, and HPQCD. And uh, from the sum rule side, as I said, you have to do the, the free loop calculation. On the left corner, I have shown you in principle the diagram. So the double line is the B quark. And on the left, where omega 1 is written, a B meson is more or less created. Um, and the middle vertex is a four quark operator, which we're interested in. And the right hand uh, anti B quark is when annihilated. And these sum rules were done originally by the Siegen group. So we were the first, which only did Q1 for BD mixing. And we went together with Thomas Rao and Matthew Kirk, who were at the time uh, both in Durham. We were redoing it for BD mixing, also for D meson mixing. And we were also uh, doing the back parameters for lifetimes, where this is also. Arising, but just if you look at the numbers, things are quite well agreeing. So the gray are our results, and else it's all the lattice results. It's just if you go to B4 and B5, there's a problem with ETM. Um, it's hard for us to argue what's going wrong, but it seems that the lattice community knows that we were using a renormalization scheme, which might not be appropriate. So it seems they have understood why things are deviating so much. If you're not going to the PS system, so for, our, for us, we had to include, before our light quark was massless, now we had to include corrections of order ms and order ms squared, just to show you how, the, how more complicated the results look like with first line RQ10 is in principle the correction for a, um, for a massless light quark. So you can, at some point, you can express the results in such a short form. If you do MS squared correction, when, okay, the equivalent becomes a little bit more complicated. And now if you look at the results, so you already see that Fermilab, so that's the green result, is a little bit on the higher side, a little bit hanging out. The newest lattice result is the bright red one. HPQCD is lower, but nicely in agreement with our result. And Okay, so maybe, okay, this is also you, <clears throat> even more precisely, you can determine these parameters for the ratio of PS over PD. And this one goes under the name of the parameter Xi, which is the square root of FPS squared times back parameter normalized to the same parameter <clears throat> for the BD meson. Okay, so now we have precise, we have, we have already very precise results for of uh, very precise experimental results. Now we have also precise results from theory and let's see what we can do with that. So at first we can compare experiment and theory. And maybe if you look at the 
upper blue blob where we have our averages for delta MD and delta MS and we compare it with the experimental numbers so over delta MD. We are 1.05 of the experimental number with an uncertainty of plus four minus seven percent. So we are perfectly sitting on within our error estimate and the errors are also smaller than 10 percent so that's very encouraging and more or less the same uh, is happening for delta ms so we are <clears throat> quite good agreement it's still that experiment is uh, for bs 50 times as 45 times more precise than theory i don't see a chance of improving to that precision but an improvement of a factor of two is probably really possible so the first thing what you can do with that is you assume that the standard model is valid and when you can extract the ckm parameter in mixing vts vtd are included so with the ckm elements which so far have not been determined directly for vtp we have some results from single top production and okay for example for VT, vtp is very close to one for vts from bs mixing we get the value of 14.91 now you can compare with what for example the fitting groups are getting here have the result from ckm fitter first from the full fit and when um, the result if ckm fitter is using only three level observables and okay principle we have a competitive precision already now to the to, to the fitting results so the the ckm fitter groups were not yet including this uh new improvements in the non-perturbative input and okay we are also we are slightly smaller but i think that's nothing to talk about an anomaly yet okay then even more precise is the ratio of delta ms over delta md because where many things are cancelling out and everything is then proportional to this parameter xi and xi there were a lot of improvements in theory from lattice but was even one group rbc uk qcd who only could calculate the ratio so far so we couldn't do the individual ones but we're working on that and from this you can determine the ratio of vtd over vts so again, this is the yellow block. We have something like 0 0.20, which at first sight agrees nicely. So the central value I've compared with CKM fit and UT fit. If you look a little bit closer, when you see, okay, you're something like 2.3 sigma below the three level fit only. So in principle, if we would use the full fit when for the CKM fit and UT fit where including their own back parameters typically the one before all these improvements so it would be a kind of endless loop therefore we decided to compare it to the tree level fit another funny thing is now the precision of b mixing it was really dramatically improving and you could also say okay i know everything in b mixing except the top quark mass which is going in as a parameter in the loop and you could use b mixing as a determination of the top quark mass and when you would get the value of 157 plus 8 minus 6 so which i think is quite entertaining um it's quite a high uh, precision and not too far off from the precision which pdg is quoting but where of course you assume something about the ckm elements Okay, now the next thing is you could say within the standard model, of course, the CKM matrix has only four parameters. So maybe I can connect my VTB, VTS, which is arising in PS mixing, and my VTS over VTD, which is arising in PS over VD mixing, to more, not more interesting, but to other elements where there's a lot of interest and things where there's a lot of interest is VCB, where we have a long standing discrepancy between two methods of extracting it, VUB, and also the CKM angle gamma, so the weak phase. And you can do that, so these are the relations where exact. So there's within the standard model with a free uh, times free unitary CKM matrix, there's no approximation done. And if you do that, when first of all you see that <coughs> our b uh, mixing is quite independent of the values of vub so if you look at the blue line this is what uh, mixing is giving us mixing and assuming that the ckm element vus is as it's determined directly when we can check what bounds we would get on vub that's my x-axis and what bounds we would get on gamma 
So principle VUP, we don't know very precisely because the inclusive and the exclusive values we spread quite a range, but luckily for our case, so if you look at the dependence of the blue line, it's more or less flat. So for us, we are we could it could also be that this would be on the very left corner, and we would have huge differences on the values of gamma. Not huge, but we could have sizable differences. But luckily, we are just in this flat region, and so if we just say that the real value of VCP is somewhere between the lower bound of the exclusive and the upper bound of the inclusive, which is really the most uh, conservative thing you can do when you already get a strict bound on gamma. And that's the first very interesting insight. So currently it looks from B mixing alone that gamma cannot be larger than something like 65 degrees. And there's a huge experimental program going on in determining this angle gamma very precisely. Currently, the uncertainty is still quite large and all these different determinations are given um, on the upper left corner and they are all quite large. So for example, the LHCB only result is going down only to something like uh, 68 degrees. All this uncertainty will be dramatically improved, so depending on what time scale you're looking, but okay, in the very far future it's going down to 0 0.5 degrees, in the foreseeable future uh, it's going down to one, one and a half degrees. So if the central values are staying, then you really, you get some amazing discrepancy between mixing and the direct determination. So another way of seeing why why can it be that you get the bound on gamma? If you look at the unitarity triangle, which is, this is quite obvious. So the unitarity triangle B mixing is giving you a circle around, uh, around one zero, which is indicated by the green line. Previously, the circle was a relatively broad band because of the non-perturbative improvement, it was shrinking. Actually, the bright green is five sigma theory um, and the dark green is our one sigma range. The current LHCB gamma is the blue ray. So these are the current LHCB values. And this dotted blue is um, a projected uncertainty of plus minus 1.5 degrees. So if it would be the case that the central value would stay, then you just need to have two measurements. You have to have a measurement of gamma. Okay, and B mixing is already precisely uh, enough known, so probably you just would like to have some more non-perturbative determinations of the mixing parameter to really be sure that everything is working and you would get an amazing um, discrepancy, which could be in the end, the reason could be that there is BSM in mixing, or another possibility would be also that there is BSM in non-leptonic tree-level decays, which is a little bit an exotic explanation, but it, it's not excluded and this would modify the extraction of gamma. Okay, you also can use this B mixing for determining VCB. And if you do that, when you get a very strong bound on VCB of the order of 42, plus minus 10 to the minus three, which is really very nicely sitting on the inclusive determinations, but it's a little bit off the exclusive one. So exclusive would be this B to D star L nu, that's quite far off. B to D L nu has already a little bit higher values. And there was recently, which is not included, also a measurement of PS decays exclusively. And this is also sitting spot on uh, their inclusive values. Okay, so that's already quite some interesting physics from doing only this. Well, I don't really want to say, but, but I'm saying it ever, but only doing this boring bread and butter physics. So you do just. Um, comparison of determination of CKM parameters and just by comparing mixing and gamma you can get quite some far-reaching consequences. Now we can, so we spend a lot of time in the machine room now talking about this non-perturbative determinations. We can look a little bit at the fun deck. What does this mean? So the anomalies we are discussing many times are related to the semi-leptonic P to K mu mu transitions. I, for simplification, I only show here one explanation. One possible explanation would be a Z prime model, which is coupling um, to a BS quark and to mu plus mu minus. As soon as you have such a Z prime, then immediately you can 
draw a mixing diagram, so a tree level mixing diagram, so a very large contribution. And at the time, um, Fermilab was bringing out the results. The standard, so you had the experiment for PS mixing was something like 17.8 inverse picoseconds. If you were taking Fermilab milk series, when your standard model prediction was going up to 20, so you already were more than two inverse picoseconds above. At that time, also all the BSM fits were favoring left handed couplings. So, if you now would add a left handed sub prime, which always gives a positive contribution to B mixing, so you even would go further away from, uh, from the experimental value. And this is a little bit shown in the plot on the lower right corner. This is the parameter space for such a sub prime model. On the x axis, I have the mass of the sub prime. On the y axis, I have the size of the coupling of the sub prime to the BS quark. In order to explain the anomalies, this parameter m sub prime and this lambda BS must lie within this black curves. So if it's within the black curves, then uh, it could explain the size of the anomalies. Now, if you were taking the standard model predictions for, for B mixing before 2016, when the blue region was excluded. So everything which is blue is excluded. Now I already told you that Fermilab will give us a problem because Fermilab is giving a large prediction and the new physics is given uh, in addition a positive shift. So if Fermilab is true, then the red region and the blue region would be excluded. And if you look very carefully, when there's a small range which still would be allowed around, I don't know, 1.5 TV, but more or less everything is, is excluded. So if this would be the right value, then we have a real killer observables for many of these BSM models. Okay, if you now include our new results when things are changing quite a lot, they are not, so this is, these are the same diagrams, <clears throat> at least the left hand side. So the blue region is the old flag average. Um, and we would now get our average, so that's, um, no, the, the purple is the average 19, so we get more space is excluded, but, but it's really far from uh, killing the model totally. We also we made some case studies thinking about if the theory precisions are reduced further. So we were assuming here 2% non-perturbative contribution. If this VCB problem will be solved, if we really know the exact value of VCB, then without changing the central values, our exclusion could go down to the orange region. So we, in the end, without having this big deviation from the experiment, we could have a similar strong exclusion, assuming that the central values are staying like Fermilab was happening. Okay, so at first that the new average is of course giving much more space for, for BSM models, so we're not excluded as strictly as we would have been if Fermilab is correct alone. On the other hand, if we just keep on increasing the theory precision, so if we keep on working hard from the non-perturbative side, we again could get very strong statements indicated by the orange region. Okay, this is just a different way of presenting that. Okay, another class of observables, one of them is still related to mixing, the other is lifetimes. So you can look at the total <coughs> lifetime total lifetime is one over the decay rate. And according to the heavy quark expansion, you can write the decay rate as an expansion in inverse powers of the heavy quark mass. So you have a leading term, gamma zero, which is describing the free quark decay. When you have corrections of order one over mb squared, so you have some hadronic matrix elements divided by mb squared, you don't have a correction of order one over mq. You have one over mq Third, and when you will see also you have some phase space enhanced diagrams. So if you draw corresponding diagrams for the decay rate, then my first line would always be a two loop diagram, while the second line would be a one loop diagram. Okay, this is just to give you an idea what has all been calculated. This is mostly a slide for my experimental friends because many times, okay, we have a theory predictions and all theory predictions are equal. I don't think we're all equal 
at least you should look if you, for example, compare B plus over BD lifetime, you have to check what is all known in this series. And okay, in principle, I have the different uh, components. And whenever calculation was done, I gave it a plus. If the calculation was independently cross-checked, I gave it a two plus. And so you can count how many pluses you get, for example, for B plus over BD, which seven here, while what was also, I will not talk today about it, but there were quite some changes in the experimental values of C baryon decays, where you have three pluses. And I think if you have three pluses, so for example, in gamma three, I have no real reliable value of the matrix element. I strongly doubt that anybody can make some strong claims um, about what the theory prediction for that is, despite this is being made. So if I was introducing um, this classification scheme and it was highly appreciated on Twitter by my experimental colleague, Mark Williams. Um, okay, so if you look at the lifetimes, they are very precisely measured here, a comparison of the BS over BD lifetime. We're just, okay, it's not yet included because I just found it yesterday that HFLUF was for PDG updating the ratio, the P S over BD lifetime is measured to be 0 0.998 with an uncertainty of four. So two per mil below one and an uncertainty of four. The theory prediction is more or less one. Okay, we have here 0 0.7 per mil above one with a theory uncertainty of two five. So in the plot here, the red is still outdated because this was before yesterday when we realized that HFLUF was updating it. So this plot is now moving uh, to the right hand side. And one extreme, so, so and I think this is really one extreme example because for PS over BD, more or less everything is counseling. So you have different contributions where counsel, where counsel at leading order, next to leading order. There was some nice theory progress we were calculating uh, for the first time with Darwin term with gamma free tilde, which gave an unexpected large result. Unfortunately, we still don't know the matrix element of this dimension six operator for the PS system precisely. So we are working on that now in order to see what's the effect on the PS over BD lifetime, but already the Wilson coefficient is large. And the other project we are currently working on is a determination of the back parameters for the BS meson. So far we have only been done for the BD meson, so with vanishing light quark masses. And as we could do for BS mixing, where we could determine the MS corrections, where also have to be done now. Why could this be interesting? So one side, it could be interesting from a QCD point of view, because if all the leading terms in the heavy quark expansion are canceling, you suddenly become sensitive to higher order terms whose effect you never would see. And now you really have um, the possibility of comparing prediction and measurement with that. On the other hand, if you still find a discrepancy, it also could be due to some kind of invisible decays. If invisible decays can, of course, be something very fancy, a BS meson decaying into light dark magda, but it could also be something very ordinary, maybe a BS meson decaying into tau plus and tau minus. This is experimentally very difficult to detect, and the current bound for BS to tau plus, tau minus, is something like 6.8 per mil. So if by new physics, in, in the standard model, this is 10 to the minus seven. So if there would be a huge new physics contribution of BS to tau plus tau minus of five per mil, then nobody would have seen it, but we probably would be able, as soon as our theory predictions uh, are completed, of, get, of seeing this five per mil effect um, as a contribution to the lifetime ratio. Okay, and another thing which is quite interesting, I mentioned it in my list of anomalies, is this is the time evolution of the measurement of the BS over BD lifetime done uh, by Matthew, Matthew Kirk. And you see in the beginning, okay, you were always close to one, so there was never doubt. The beginning big uncertainty, the measurement was always getting closer and closer. And just very recently, so if you look at the papers, LHCB, the most recent value was in June last year. Atlas gave out the measurement in January this year. CMS just um, published uh, a conference paper for uh, HPCP, uh, I think two or three weeks ago. 
And now experiments are seriously disagreeing. So Atlas is much, much lower. For example, if Atlas would be correct and if theory is understood well, when this would be a 2% invisible P sub S decay. Okay, but of course it, it cannot be. So somebody must be wrong or some um, uncertainties have been underestimated. And for quite some time, I don't know, nobody was really jumping on that, but I have the feeling that now experimentalists are really aware of that and they are working heavily on that. It's not only gamma S which is um, disagreeing, it's also the mixing, the delta gamma S. So delta gamma S is the decay rate difference between the heavy and light. Delta gamma S has also a heavy quark expansion, but all the leading terms are missing and it starts only at order one over MB further. And again, so I have shown here the list what is already calculated. So you see many pluses means people are working hard and many things are known um, for this dimension six. So this gamma three contributions, even part of next to next to leading order is known. Matrix elements have been done by many groups. So that's already quite uh, reliable. Okay, so if you have gamma one, two, so M12 we were calculating first, now we were calculating gamma 12 means we can determine delta gamma S and we can determine the semi-leptonic CP asymmetry. So first delta gamma S, so these are updated standard model predictions. In this unit it's 91 plus minus 13 compared to experiment which is 88 plus minus 6, so it looks amazing very good agreement. At some point people were always concerned about quark hadron duality in the heavy quark expansion. So this would be the observables where things would go wrong because delta gamma s is dominated by b to two charm quarks and the strange. So it means you have less phase space. So if there would be some large duality violations when you would expect to see it here. So this looks like an amazing agreement. For the PD system, the prediction is very small and the measurement is unfortunately not there yet. So you see minus 1.3 plus minus 6.6. .6. So it's just, we didn't see anything yet. Okay, this is just a list of improvements. But here things also became a little bit strange this year. So I made this plot by hand after the conference last week uh, in Atoxa. Because now the same experiments which were disagreeing uh, for the BS lifetime were also seriously disagreeing um, for, for delta gamma S. So, if you, so the red one is our standard model prediction. CMS has a very high value but still in agreement with standard model. LHCB has a smaller value but also still in standard model. So if you just look at the three, you say okay the one is on the lower end, the one is on the other. On the other hand, if you delete the standard model prediction, when it looks like ATLAS and LLCB will favor values around 70, while CMS favors values around 110. And of course, so this cannot be. So there's something fishy, and as I said. So this is the analysis of the decay B sub S to J psi phi, and you're extracting the total decay rate, so the BS lifetime, delta gamma S, and also this weak mixing angle. Okay, so I'm very curious how this will be resolved in future. And finally, if you look not at the real part of gamma 1, 2 over M12, but at the imaginary part, you get with semi-leptonic asymmetries. I was introducing some time ago in the standard model, tiny, tiny values, two times 10 to the minus five in the BS system, uh, minus four times 10 to the minus four in the BD system. Okay, the uncertainties are still much larger. So I have chosen the same units for the experimental bounds. So where I have the two times 10 to the minus five, the experimental uncertainty is currently 280 in this unit, but the numbers will go down. And of course, if you find something of the order of 50 and you have a value of two in the standard model and then is estimated uncertainty of 0 0.2, then this would be perfect because where you don't have to discuss about how big is the hadronic uh, uncertainty. Okay, and this plot on the lower right is just to show you that there's a lot of experimental progress going in and all this uncertainties will go down, maybe not directly to the standard model one, but at least for PS, uh, for PT, it can go down to the standard model. Luca, what is time saying? Um, five minutes more. 
Five minutes, okay, so um, that's <laughs> perfect. Unfortunately, I cannot see my time because I'm sharing the screen. Okay, so for the jump lifetimes, maybe you remember in the very beginning, in the introduction, I was telling you the B mesons were all have roughly the same lifetime, while for the JOM system, we have huge differences. So we had a value of 2.5 between D plus and D zero. So naively, <coughs> at first look, you would say, okay, this is never going to work because it means you have a one, that's the charm clock, which is decaying. So it's the same for the two mesons. And when you need 150% correction, but actually if you look a little bit closer, it's a ratio. So it's already sufficient if you have a one plus a 40% corrections divided by a one minus 40% correction. And 40% is of course not the precision, but at least it could give you a kind of order of magnitude. We were calculating it with the same sum rules and we got the green band, which I think is very promising. It's of course a crazy large uncertainty. So plus 0 0.7 minus 0 0.82, but just the fact that we are getting the central value, right? Well, we were looking how the central value of 2.7 is set up. So it's the one, which means the charm clock of the D plus and the charm clock of the D zero are decaying when we have this phase based enhanced term. And when this lambda over MC looks like 0 0.25 to the third power. And in brackets, I have my dimension six plus dimension seven. So dimension seven should be suppressed by lambda over MC. So just our calculation and doing this naive power counting indicates that the expansion parameter in the charm system is something like 0 0.3. As I said, this is clearly not the precision, but it's also on the other hand, it's, it's also not that you cannot do anything in the charm uh, system. So unfortunately, the full analysis with all these ingredients we only could do for D plus over D zero, but hopefully we soon can do D S plus over D zero. And then we would like um, to continue studying the charm, um, the, the, the charm baryon cases. So here it would of course also be nice to have some lattice confirmation of our sum rule calculation because for the lifetimes currently only uh, the sum rules are available. It's, that's nice, that's better than the situation before where we had nothing, but it's always good for these complicated things to have some confirmations to make sure um, that we are really getting the most interesting part. Okay, so this is a little bit in contrast to maybe the general reception of charm physics because they have a terrible reputation. I think one reason where this reputation is coming from is charm mixing, because if you do naively the tools you're applying for B system, if you just take the formula and apply it for the D system, then you get predictions which are far off the experimental value. So by far off, I mean something like a factor 10 to the four, 10 to the five. And this is indicated in this plot, which is made by an experimentalist in order to make fun of theorists. So this uh, index, reference index are just different papers. And when these individual numbers are predictions for the mixing parameter X or Y, and you see we vary between 10 to the minus seven and 10 to the minus one. But okay, if you look a little bit closer, when you actually, see that the whole problem of demixing is an extreme severe gym constellation. So really crazy severe gym constellation. And this can um, shade over many things. So for example, for demixing, it's actually it's three diagrams which are contributing. Each diagram is a little bit larger than the experimental value. But if you sum them up, then they are canceling to 10 to the minus five of the experimental value. So if something is a little bit going wrong in one diagram, it's actually sufficient that something of the order of 20% is going wrong in one diagram, when this 10 to the minus five suddenly becomes a one. So that's something which we're also currently studying. I don't have results which I can present already, but it might not be despite at first sight, it looks like charm mixing is 10 to the 
five off and therefore you cannot make any uh, predictions in the German sector. It might actually that you have maybe only some corrections of 20% uh, which is sufficient for explaining that and also the lifetime studies indicate a reasonable expansion parameter not for making precision calculations but at least for making some estimates and which lie in the right ballpark. And this we used as a motivation for studying delta ACP. So probably many of you have heard that CP violation in the charm system was found last year in March by LHCP for the first time. We had a five sigma measurement and the question was, can this be a standard model or has it have to be your physics? And people are still fighting about that. Our approach was that Actually, the arguments against standard model prediction in the German sector, we think we somehow can counteract that. We also, we don't have a very solid prediction, but just using the methods which are working well in the B system, our conclusion was that the standard model prediction for this CP violation is much, much smaller, by more than a factor 10 when experiments. So people should look for new physics explanations and we did here. Um, also an example of a set prime model. Okay, that's more or less what I wanted to say. I hope I could convince you that there was really some severe progress mostly stemming from, yeah, from, from the machine back in mixing and lifetimes for theory predictions. At first sight, everything agrees with experiment, which is nice for people doing model building because many of the PSM models are not excluded anymore. Uh, and for some of these quantities, so it's not only lattice which is ruling the town. For many quantities, you have no chance to compete with lattice like decay constant. But for example, for the back parameters, we are in a good situation and we really could contribute um, to making uh, this new precision. The nice thing is also that the theory uncertainties can still be further reduced. So in our case, it's the matching to be done next to leading order. Also lattice will improve. So as I said, um, HPQCD is currently working. When all these studies have quite some consequences for BSM effects. So currently I like really most this comparison of B mixing with the CKM angle gamma and the gamma not touching the circle. So if this would stay that uh, yes, yeah, as I said, that would be amazing. It's two measurements and that's it. And you have to make sure that you didn't uh, miss anything. Okay, and finally, I think nice thing is really that this is, is a field where there's a lot of things which can be done with current technology. It's just about yeah, having time and having manpower. Thanks a lot. I think that's all what I wanted to say. And this is a list of people who contributed. So on top there's the machine deck. So with three gentlemen are working. Oh, sorry, on top is the sun deck. This gentleman on the upper right corner are mostly spending the time there. When Gilberto and Matthew are in between and the hard working crew is on the lower line working in the machine deck. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you, Alex, for this very nice comprehensive talk on the anomalies. Uh, is there any question? Please just unmute your microphone and just make the question. Hi, this is Sven. Um, you gave this nice overview and uh, for the theorists you gave these star ratings and uh, checked and double checked, which was very good. Although even there, I could imagine that uh, if one effect is overlooked, it's overlooked by all the groups and you can still be wrong. Yeah, so, so that you can see me, it's better if I ask a question. <laughs> um, for the experimental data, uh, your talk uh, gave me actually less confidence <laughs> in, in the reliability of the results than I might have had before. Uh, you were reporting several contradictory measurements and showed how they moved over time and uh, how well, my personal impression is that if there's an anomaly in flavor physics, I just wait a couple of years and they tend to go away. Um, I don't know, you, you presented it in a way that uh, one and at least I didn't get uh, a lot of um, more confidence into the experimental result. Do you feel the same or did I just misinterpret what you were saying? Uh, so I was putting 
a big emphasis on this B sub S to J psi phi. Because so this is the analysis, you do an angular analysis and where you can extract all these observables. And this was measured for the first time in 2012. And it, this really had implications for theory because it was for the first time before years we were doing next leading order corrections to delta gamma s, but we never. So we were fighting at the conferences about quark hadron duality, but we didn't have experimental input. And when suddenly LHCP was, was measuring it and it seemed within uncertainties, it seemed to sit spot on. Um, now for this particular decay, so this problem, I was jump, maybe I was jumping too much around it, but I'm very excited. And there about were also many results that you were discussing. This, <laughs> this had, yeah, but the, in principle, it's always one measurement. So all this time evolution of the PS lifetime and also my hand-drawn diagram, that's always, it's yeah. one, it's one analysis. It's always with decay P sub S to J psi phi. Mm -hmm. And where we, I think it was for the first time it was mentioned, we had a workshop in Durham last April, where it was mentioned in a talk that we see between Atlas and LHCB, a big discrepancy, but nobody was talking about it. Whenever I was asking my LHCB friends or Atlas, okay, and just now I have the feeling that people are really taking it serious and say, hey, there's something going on. So I, I hope this, okay, this has to be settled. So it cannot be yes. correct. And I'm extremely curious what will be the final result. And I think for me, the very promising thing is that also Atlas and CMS were spending much more effort now on this because the results from LHCB are never claiming that we're doing anything wrong, but we have to be cross-checked. The anomalies have dramatic implications. You want to make sure that this is correct. And you, as I say, I don't want to say anything bad about my LHCB friends, but if this would be the only experiment, well, it always can be that something was overlooked. Yeah. But they will also improve their measurements and come up with uh, updates of this. And, yeah. Yeah? No, no, and so for me, the most promising thing was one of these metamost discussions where yeah. different people were jumping in the game when, because I was always, whenever somebody is presenting results, we never say in a talk we are differing by four sigma. Mm -hmm. And I'm always asking a question where we had a longer discussion and it was quite yeah, funny yeah. because one lady was uh, making some comments and luckily I made a screenshot and it seems she was forced to <laughs> delete the comments <laughs> because she was telling me too much. <laughs> But okay, I'm convinced they are taking it serious now and I will be extremely curious how this will be resolved. So I, I don't know, maybe Atlas was doing something wrong. Maybe everybody was underestimating uncertainties, but for sure we will learn something out of it. So it, it cannot stay like that. It cannot be that Atlas is this value and the other have that. that it's, it's not possible. Yeah. Or you have a localized BSM effect between <laughs> <laughs> position. Only in one picture. Yeah, okay. But, but I'm not claiming that this is in general happening. So this, this, I didn't want to give the impression that for every observable this is happening. I mean, I there are make... other flavor anomalies out there that you did not discuss in, in, in detail today. And there I always had the impression that latest results always come closer to the standard model. Uh, this, but maybe this is my general skeptical bias towards uh, these anomalies, maybe. I think we had some like that. There was a B to tau nu that was, but okay, it's, it was where the problem was the identity. So the leptonic decay B to tau mm. nu at some point from, I think yes, it was far, far, which was quite yeah. off, but where I think we underestimated systematically. No, I, I was thinking the of uh, RD or RD star. Yeah, I think all the, the latest measurements, they are substantially closer to the standard model than the original Baba. It's, it's, it's hinging on the uh, old Baba measurement, yeah, which really shows this, uh, I don't know, four or five sigma discrepancy. Well, I, I never did the fit. So the, the fit people for, for PS mu um, so where we have, for example, this P5 prime anomalies. If mm -hmm. you were looking at the different Q square points before, there was more or less one which was deviating a lot. So you just look by it and say, oh, that's a quite a discrepancy, while the others were closer. Now with the updated Morion, the big discrepancy went closer to the standard model, while the others went slightly <laughs> away. So um, just looking by eye, you would say, oh, it's actually close to standard model, but mm -hmm. 
okay, I never did with fits by myself, but when we do the fit, we said, oh, that's actually much more consistent now. So it's increasing our things. It was not huge, but it was 0 0.8 sigma or something like that by the one going close and the others. I think, I think it's interesting. So I, also my FPCP talk for the outlook, I said, please make use of the anomalies. We can learn a lot about it, but I also made an example for a quantity which was between 2003 and now differing by five sigma, which was the number B lifetime. If you look at the PDG average in 2003, so we should not forget about this possibility. But on the other hand, if you're always too over-conservative, if you always say, oh no, it will go away, well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have some fun. I think it's about getting the right middle way. So getting decently <laughs> excited <laughs> okay. without okay. forgetting everything, every common sense. <laughs> okay, thanks. Any other question, comment? So Alex, which is your favorite anomaly? The one that for sure currently, the way. currently it's because okay, I'm working for ages on these predictions for delta gamma s. And to me it was already solved. And I said, okay, we we have the proof that all our tools are working. And as I said, it was for me, it was last week that I really got this newest number and just I did yesterday I was drawing, so this hand drawing what I have shown you, which puzzled me and this is something but but that's a pure that's clearly a pure experimental problem else if for the uh, for the anomalies i like most it's actually an old one um it's with dimuon d <laughs> d zero dimuon asymmetry um I was mentioning in the beginning, it's a 3.6 sigma discrepancy. The problem is it was also only measured by one experiment because it was crucial for getting this precision to be able to switch the magnetic field. And this would have implications for the semi-leptonic asymmetries and also for the decay rate difference of BD mesons. And there are quite some funny possibilities how to explain it. So one thing would be you have some um, new physics effects in tree level decays, which are just so large that we are not really affecting everything, but, but you could make up some, at least you can make up some nice parameter spaces. I, but I'm not a real professional model builder, could not make up a nice model explaining that, but that might be the next step. But of course, where you also, you want to have an experimental cross check. I see. Any other question or comments? Otherwise, let's uh, thank again uh, and clap in virtually, okay, Alex. <laughs> Thanks a lot. How do you clap? I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can. <laughs> yeah, I see it. So. <laughs> and it, it's been a pity not to have you here in Madrid, but thanks a lot for giving this virtual talk and hope to see you here in Madrid in the next well, week, hopefully. Me too. <laughs> thank you very much for having us. Thanks to you. Bye, Alex. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good time. Bye. <laughs>